<laughs> I think we're online anyway. We're, folks, we're, we're operating at spring break in Texas, and we're operating with uh, a real skeleton crew here at Setter White Log Homes, but we're grateful that all of you are here today. Um, and we're going to talk about um, log homes in a new light. Um, you know, this is, uh, lighting is, it can be kind of a technical uh, subject, but we're going to go through a lot of recommendations by the end of this program today and, uh, and discuss th choices that you can make, even, even if it's not a log home. Of course, all of our examples will be uh, log homes because, uh, uh, because that's what we do and we've got a lot of pictures of that. But uh, this could apply to uh, any home you're in now. It could uh, do a remodel like we're doing here at our own Satterwhite offices. Um, uh, there's a lot of new technology and a lot of exciting things that have developed in recent years uh, with, with lighting. Uh, this, is the, this is the light bulb that we've all known our whole life. This is what this whole uh, episode's going to revolve around. But to understand a little about light, a little about the development of lighting systems, why we use the language that we use when we, when we talk about lighting, and maybe some of those old terms that we've all become accustomed to need to go away because it's simpler to really understand the science. Now, uh, that sounds like this is going to be a school lesson, and that's not the case because lighting is all about aesthetics and beauty. Um, so I think, I think one of the most interesting things about this particular subject is construction is such a, uh, uh, usually such a guy-oriented thing, but, but the lighting is that finishing touch that adds the beauty, and it's always, I think that the, the ladies who might see this program will really get more from this than the men do. So this could, this could apply to either remodeling like we have on our, in our own offices currently, uh, or it can apply to brand new construction. And you can make different, you'll make different choices about which way you go and about what kind of lighting systems that you, that you choose for your home. So this is, this is really part of decorating um, in, the, in the, the beauty of your home. So let's, let's, let's go to the slides. I'm going to be off camera most of the day, and I've got a few slides. And uh, there's, our, there's our show title. Let's... let's uh, Fade out that logo, Sandy. Let me let me uh, let me grab this. I'll do it. I'm, I'm not even on camera. When the slides are up, I can walk all over and, and work the machines. So, like I said, the ladies are gonna are going to understand this program a lot better than the guys right off the bat because anybody who grew up when I did back in the 1970s had a sister or a cousin or a girlfriend who had one of these Sylvania or General Electric makeup mirrors. And uh, they had a little switch. You can see there at the bottom right-hand corner, I've got a close-up. And see how it has those positions that where uh, you would set it for daytime or office or home or evening. And it had a little set of plastic colored mirrors inside those uh, the makeup mirror at the right, and it would put different colors on there. And those, those colors, most of us, the first time I saw one of these mirrors, I didn't have a clue what that meant. But I totally understand it now, and you'll understand it too as we go through this video, and you'll understand how just this basic knowledge uh, from your makeup mirror when you were in uh, junior high that that's going to inform you a lot about the lighting systems available to you in your home today, which are radically different, uh, these, these uh, systems. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to detail what this is all about here. Daylight means uh, light, has, light has color, and it's something that we don't often think about in, in uh, lighting systems when we're designing light in our homes, but it's something that 
today's t the the products available today that never existed before and were not even feasible to do uh, those you have a lot of choices that you've never had before so daylight we really have when we talk about light humanity really has one frame of reference and I think about log homes logs and wood are such a natural product uh, so we want to we're going to talk not in, in terms of special effects or theatrical lighting but in terms of natural lighting that goes with uh, wood because I think that's what most people who have a log home are going to be concerned about and so the, obviously the the major thing in in our lives as far as the major reference point in in our lives is outdoor daylight and that's what that that one position represents now that daylight in an artificial light system was never actually possible they simulated it with the little plastic by putting a blue filter over there and and that's something that even the electrical electricians and suppliers and different people will still refer to as as uh, daylight being blue it's not blue daylight is it's our re it's our reference to white it is the most clear it's the real thing the real thing the only real thing we know the sun that office switch the next one on your little makeup mirror that's green that's that green filter that it threw over there pretty accurate because come back off the uh, slides back to the camera for a second Sandy the other wouldn't it be funny if I broke this let's come out to camera three the other the other thing in our lives besides this light bulb right here which is our primary reference for residential lighting but the other the other lighting fixture in our most of our world in our offices and schools has been the fluorescent tube bulb and this this is a different lighting technology it creates light in a different way than uh, an incandescent light bulb we're going to talk about the ways that these different devices generate illumination but this uh, the fluorescent bulb is actually a, a, a gas-filled tube that ignites a plasma inside this and one of the characteristics of fluorescent is it's a pretty hideous light uh, I really can't stand it I hope you all avoid it like the plague in your homes well except the the true fluorescent tube is pretty much going away it's still available you can buy them down at Home Depot in fact I've got boxes of them right here I may pull out while we're talking about this but the true these are being replaced by something that fits our old fixtures but it is an LED inside an LED a light emitting diode strip inside the tube now and those can produce beautiful light in certain circumstances we'll talk about we'll cover that all later but um, the true fluorescent tube that we all grew up with it's it's very um, the color spectrum that this thing the color spectrum of the light this thing produces is very poor and it's very heavy and green it, it's it's good for uh, <clears throat> if you were the bride of Frankenstein that would be this would be ideal to do your makeup with so let's let's go back to slides and I'll I'll try to I'm gonna have to go fast with this I've got too much material folks are we seeing audio okay that's that makes me feel better The worst thing on a live stream is for somebody to be presenting and there be no audio. I hope I hope you guys can can see us on this. And if anybody's watching, you might. Uh, I'm I'm really working in Satterwhite Live. We do this every Thursday at 11:30, and and our intention for these live streams is to get to the point where we are doing actual interaction and in chat, so that as uh, Sam Satterwhite or Josh in and Blake are here there those are our normal presenters everybody at Satterwhite is out of town this week it's spring break so everybody uh, uh, I'm filling in so that we've got a show this week so all right let's go back to the slides and we'll just touch on on our little makeup mirror that's one of the key points that I wanted to do that's on input six Sandy there we go so so that green position that flipped a piece of green plastic over your makeup mirror 
that simulated, that added that green cast of a fluorescent light tube that you were likely to be working under at an office so that you could adjust your makeup. Uh, maybe less yellow or whatever, you know, the, th the thing would just do bad things to you. And then what is the next item there, the, the, the next filter? Oh, and home. And the home is that incandescent light bulb, which has color qualities that are not, uh, that are quite different from daylight. So it is a more warm light. Uh, the language of light is usually called, uh, I mean, there's white, white light is the reference. And warm light is, you know, the warm glow of a fire. We all know what warm light is. And cool light is like that winter day uh, snowscape that's kind of, uh, that, that's drifting to a higher color temperature that people are prone to call blue. Uh, but the thing that you have to understand that there's a big, uh, our own psychology plays a great deal of reference in this. So we go through life and we don't really notice uh, we don't notice the light color because our brain adjusts. Well, you can, if you stand under a, uh, under a Halloween lights long enough, you'll see white and you'll, your brain will make you think that you're seeing things. But one of the key points that we're going to do uh, to get to today about the lighting systems that you choose for your home is not to mix sources. Because if you mix these sources and you put an incandescent with a daylight system and you put those all in the same room, it's, it's jarring, it's ugly. Uh, it's, it's uh, uh, in some cases, just hideous. And, I, and if you visit our offices, we'll show you some here because it's always been a matter of what bulb fits and just put it in and whether they're the right thing or not. So the, the fourth position there is an evening position and, and it's represented on the uh, GE makeup mirror there as a pink and that's a, uh, you know, some other out in the town or whatever. I, I think that's just a, a catch-all in case the others don't match. But anyway, the makeup mirror is a, is a reference on all this. I just want to say a little bit about me. My name is Danny Grizzle. Uh, you'll hear the guys in our live streams yell, hey, Danny, because, uh, because I'm the guy who runs the technology here and, and running, uh, put together the, our little YouTube streaming video and everything. I've been... I've been talking light since the early 1970s, so for over 50 years. And this is a film crew that I worked on. Oh, that guy there on the right, by the way, his name's Reed Smoot. But if you've ever gone to IMAX theaters and seen the big, the huge screen movies like at Yellowstone or the Grand Canyon and things like that, and a lot more, he, uh, he's the guy. He's done tons and tons of IMAX films. George Griner is his assistant on the left. So, you know, that's my background. I've, I've, I've been dealing with professional lighting systems for 50 years. So all this language is very uh, uh, native to me. In fact, I'm seeing something right here that I hadn't planned to see. This is a Mole Richardson generator that's got a 500 cubic inch engine because these old lighting systems, one of their characteristics is they take tremendous amounts of electricity and especially when you're out pulling uh, major motion picture lights during the day. But this is an example of mixed source lighting right here uh, that I probably don't have a better example in this whole show. And that is uh, my buddy there, Mike Schroeder. This is the evening, the sun set. And you know, as the uh, sun moves through the arc of the sky, uh, noon daylight, uh, noontime straight up day, uh, sunlight are that you know, that um, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., that sunlight the, where the sun is directly overhead and it's, and it's coming directly through the, the uh, atmosphere by the shortest path possible, that's what we as humanity reference as white light. It's pure light. That's, that's the reference for all other things. And so all of our other things, as the sun goes through the arc of the sky and it gets low on the horizon, we know all, we've all seen those beautiful golden sunsets. That's because it's coming through the Earth's atmosphere at an oblique angle, and the par particles of the atmosphere are scattering the lower frequencies of light. So it's, it's uh, knocking out 
some colors. And that's what we're seeing here. This is close to sunset. And so the light is shifting kind of blue at that end of the day. And he's got the access panel to the generator, the motion picture lighting generator open there. And it's got in, in some incandescent lights on the inside. And they're at a different color temperature. And you can distinctly see, uh, distinctly see that. So I said, uh, one of the major points I'll make today is don't mix lighting sources in your home. And that's almost always true, but there's exceptions. Maybe if, uh, if I don't get tired of talking, we'll do that. Uh, so I've got a background, and, and a lot of you, boy, I just typed, I just, I built this slideshow and finished it maybe 10 minutes before he started. Yeah. So I'm going to find out I got a horrendous typo in here someplace. But, but it is true, when I say that lighting is, is uh, an aesthetic thing, your home, lighting will make your home come alive. And I do a lot of the photography, you know, most of the photography that we have in circulation at Sutter White Log Homes, I am the photographer. So these are all images that I've made. And I, I started to put some outtakes in this slideshow and just ran out of time to build that because I think that a lot of people see the, the beautiful photography that's prevalent in the log home industry and think, well, that can, nothing that beautiful can ever happen uh, in my home. But it can happen in your home. It's one of those little details that you pay attention to. If you care about it, it'll happen. And if you care about it, it can happen without spending any additional money. Uh, there's, there's a, like anything, lighting, you can, the sky's the limit. And, and at, the end of the, at the end of this presentation today, I will show you some of the latest technology um, that is quite costly. But most of the things we're going to talk about, almost all the things talked about today, uh, don't cost any extra. It's just a matter of paying attention. So I'll just, just lighting, lighting is the thing that makes that home uh, feel lived in, that warmness at the end of the day. We've all walked into a house without the lights on. As the photographer, uh, you know, one of the things that I, that I tend to is when I'm photographing homes, I want every light bulb to be in. It's my, my, uh, my terror to find some unique little light bulb in a home that I'm photographing burned out and no replacement. How bad would that be if that lighting fixture above the bathtub, if one of those lights were burned out? But anyway, I'm getting in my worries about when I'm doing this work. Let me just, uh, we're talking about artificial lighting today, but natural lighting is something that you should consider with your home about how your home is sited. Because a lot of us use gable glass and that kind of thing. Uh, that has huge implications about how you site a home. Uh, energy, if you site gable glass pointing in a west or south uh, direction, that has, that has energy consumption consequences for the life of your home. Now, it can be done, but you have to maybe modify that design, have a, an extended uh, gable porch, something to keep uh, solar radiation from driving your utility bills. But but yes, you know, some people, if you have the option, you know, a lot of us have lots where we, we don't have much flexibility in how, how the uh, house fits the land. So you need, to, you need to design the house to fit the land or pick a plan that they need to match. But you could have gable glass. Artists, artists have uh, traditionally liked north, north light. Uh, that was the thing. And all the great artists in Paris and those places, they all like studios with a bank of windows to the north because it just produces gorgeous interior light, but no heat. The sun never strikes, that kind of thing. So let me see. I've got too many. I can't talk about all these pictures, and I'll want to. But, but just all these, these um, light does make your home come alive. You can see that light inside the shower there. The, uh, the vanities. We're not going to talk about fixtures. That's, that's an, another type of decorating choice. You can do all kinds of things in homes, but the beauty of your home and, and how you design the, the lighting design. Uh, this one's got a lot of things going on right here. We have some beautiful uh, uh, 
um, candles, which are probably LED fixtures there, but not always. I see a lot and a lot of candles in homes. In fact, when I travel to photograph homes, I take a big container full of an assorted size of candles because I it just I, I it's, it's been just I would just feel bad to burn a customer's candles for hours while I'm setting up these photographs. But those antique type light bulbs in the above the bar there, where they're um, they've got that retro look and those exposed filaments, and they look real you know like something from the 20s or something. They just look they just look very cool. All these kind of fixtures are now LED or light emitting diodes. So you have all your design choices and you have choices in the type bulbs that you put in there in their color output. That's the main thing that I was really wanting to introduce into this conversation today because I just, I just don't think that we, we never grew up thinking about the color of light. And the one thing that, that um, I'm jumping to the end of my presentation now because we will talk about how to work with vendors and your, your contractors and how to not step on toes and everybody remain friends and, and not to uh, make trouble for them. But um, we've, we're at a place now where we can think in, in terms of light in the same terms that we've always been accustomed to thinking of in our stain choice selections in paint colors, uh, our color scheme of the house. And so since you can go down to the store and buy anything, that's not something you would do with your, with your paint and your other choice colors. And there is a variety now, so we just want to be aware of that and the technologies driving that. But like I say, I'm the, I'm the photographer here at Setter White. This is just some of my work. That's our office in LJ, Georgia. And, and light is everything. I mean, I did a lot of work to bring those logs out. They're under, they're under uh, porches and everything. So that sort of thing, these, these beautiful nighttime type pictures. Boy, isn't that a great shot there? I, I love photographing that building at Easter time with the uh, dogwood blooming out in the front. It's a, uh, we could use a, a happier spring coming up. We're facing a lot of challenges right now. The, the lighting choices that you make in your home set a motion. I mean, uh, I think I probably made that point, but uh, we, we see some things here. Just when we think of those great events of our life, whether it's, whether it's that walk on the beach holding hands with your, your husband or wife or girlfriend and on, uh, at sunset, uh, these pictures of uh, Alan and Christie's wedding, the, their first dance. They've just been married there at the left. Uh, the candles at Heartlight uh, Ministries, Mark Gregston's Parenting Today's Teens, that's his, uh, in his offices there. That Christmas scene at the right, um, with a Christmas, the, the interior of that home, we just, we feel color more than we see color very often. That home, that the warmth of the interior of that home, that cool blue light on the outside is telling me it reinforces that winter, the cold world outside. Um, these things, we feel color. Uh, light is very evocative, just like this picture of, of the fireworks that were set off after, after uh, Alan and Christie's wedding. So there's tents and the guests are collected there. We see strings of light bulbs through the night sky. And those are things that, that uh, those lighting strings, a lot of people do that kind of thing around log homes. They'll, so we'll have some more pictures here. But that warmth of hearth and home, that fire in the fireplace, again, these are, are natural references that we feel to color that we don't often think about. But when we reflect on our lives and those, uh, uh, those moments where a young man's going to take a young woman out and propose, he's not going to do that just anywhere. It's going to be someplace special. There might be a candlelit dinner involved. There might be some some kind of special thing. This is another. This is a actually. This is a home. That warmth of approaching a log home, and we can see that warm glow from inside on a cold autumn evening and the, 
the leaves are turning and, and mostly fallen from those trees in the background. We come in maybe after a hard day's work and that home is just inviting because of that, that color draws us in from the cold, cruel world. So this is more, of course, this is more of a summertime. Well, I see the pumpkins out. But th so that would be uh, October at the Satterwhite Ranch there. But these are, the Satterwhite family entertains quite a lot, of course, uh, involved with a bunch of worthy causes. So we've, we've done a lot of photography at the farm. We see the light strings there. And whenever we gather, that lighting is important. We all know that difference between that magical night under the mirror ball in, at a dance in the prom or whatever. Boy, how different does that room feel at that moment than at the end of the night when they turn the lights on or it's time for the cleaning people to come in. So that's, that's what lighting does for your home in paying attention to these things. That's a cookhouse, very popular with a lot of people uh, on log homes, a freestanding cookhouse. The, uh, the balance, that's evening. This is the sun is set. That sky is turned. We all know that color, whether it be this is a sunset picture, but when we think about lighting, lighting schemes for your home and what you do on the porches, imagine how you're going to use that space. We, you know, I thought, oh, we ought to give a, uh, we ought to give a, sh a shout out to uh, uh, Danny Minji's or, or uh, uh, the guys over at Bar Nun Cowboy Church because I know those guys, they're going to sit out on the porch in the morning before the sun comes up with a steaming cup of coffee. And maybe they don't want a certain type of light that's, that's too bright, that is jarring. That just right thing is that, is that stillness of the morning, getting ready for their day. It's, it's, it's a very evocative and emotional thing, the lighting scheme of your home. Uh, desert light, again, approached beautiful landscaping there with some lava rock and contrasting colors. This is a very neat, neat customer. Uh, and John Cornell, I consider a friend. Boy, I just love meeting customers. I'm, I'm so fortunate. I'm one of the few people in this company who gets to visit homes uh, after they're truly finished. Uh, inside that same home in that sky, the same situation, the sun sets, the end of the day, the warmth of the home. Boy, I wish I'd built a fire in that fireplace. Wouldn't that have been perfect? But I think this was in the summer and it was plenty hot already. Um, you know, this is uh, not the greatest example. I lit, I lit some candles when we were visiting a house and yeah, the shot was made in the middle of the daytime. So. It, it's, it's not totally working uh, where something like this would really be done in the evening. And I think, I think a lot of ladies especially instinctively understand about uh, the beauty of lighting and things. This is a, one of our homes, the back porch uh, in Appalachia up in uh, northern Georgia. In fact, this is very close to our LJ Georgia office, which everybody should should visit if you have the chance at all. It's such a wonderful facility. But I put some, uh, some little tea lights or whatever. The, I, I take candles with me. And so the, just that on the table, I thought, well, we need that. You know, here's, here's what an architectural photographer, maybe these places weren't, weren't uh, optimal. This is what, after the photographer who's really thinking about light is working on these scenes, watch how these homes come to life when the light bulbs are turned on. He's put highlights. You know, he's, guys like me, we can manipulate reality and bring in, uh, by compositing images, we can bring in a lot of lighting that, that uh, you know, we can put a million dollar lighting job on something in a temporary manner to get a fantastic photograph. And pretty much everything that you see in Architectural Digest, only at the extreme high end, and I'm talking about homes, five, ten million dollars, do people get that concern with landscape light? I mean, you know, it, it, it can get, about like anything else, it can be beyond, uh, and that's not the focus of what we're doing today. We're talking about 
things that you can do to your home just by paying attention, not by spending extra money. So I'm going to just do a, a short section here. Boy, I, I, th I keep saying that I'm going to do this fast, but I don't, do I? Um, let's just talk about how light is created. And artificial light is not real news to mankind. It's been known from antiquity. And, of course, there was, uh, there was fire from caveman days. But even in antiquity, people were building swords and working metal and they had forge, forges. And they saw that if you heat a piece of steel or whatever that metal may be, if you get it hot enough, it's gonna glow. It's gonna produce light. And that is such a, a key concept to understand about, about just the science. The science is that basic, but of course, I'm gonna tell you more specifics so that you can relate to the lighting choices that you make for your home. So. You know, we have, we have vocabulary that goes with all these things, and so who knows their origins, but I bet it was on a forge when somebody talks about something being red hot. That's what we're seeing right there. That is red hot. And we all have some sense that if something is hotter than red hot, it's white hot. That's, that's key because it's literally true. There's Thomas Edison. He... Um, it's, it's a popular misconception that he invented the light bulb. However, like Henry, Henry Ford didn't invent the car either, but he's the guy who made it practical and made it available to all of humanity. And it's quite a story. I've been reading too much preparing for this presentation. There's his patent. Can you believe? What are the dates on that? The patent filing was in 1890. And this might have been a, an actual, not the very first, that doesn't look like the very first patent, but this is getting close. And we see that screw bulb base on figure one there to, in the middle. Uh, there's a couple of key things that are very important to understand about this, this light bulb that Thomas Edison did because it's basically taking that thing that we knew, if you heat something, if you heat something, it glows. And so that light bulb, the Edison bulb, that's called the Edison base, that's the screw, screw base on all of our old traditional light bulbs, the way every home in the world, I suppose, is fitted is because of that Edison screw base bulb. Um, that's a key thing to see there. And also that filament hanging down inside that glass enclosure inside the bulb. Uh, how important was light coming to humanity? Well, when Time Magazine talked, they, we all know they do, they're a man of the year and, or a person of, the, person of the decade, person of the century. But Thomas Edison by, changed the world so profoundly and opened the darkness to light that he was named Man of the Millennia. The Millennium at Y2K, the year, at the year 2000, because he had influenced the direction of humanity more than any other person in that thousand years. That's a remarkable achievement, especially for the guy who... Uh, there's so many controversies involved in that. I'm just touching that a little bit. There is that, a little close-up of that light bulb and that filament. We're going to talk about that filament a little bit because Thomas Edison... He, he tested over 6,000 materials before he found something that uh, he could, w could use commercially. My clickers quit working. But the curious thing, even though he was the man of the millennia, is the guy who actually made this all work for all practical purposes was Nikola, Nikola Tesla. And Tesla was an employee in Edison's uh, Menlo Park laboratory, and they had a dispute over uh, whether the lighting systems were to be alternating current, which Tesla advocated, or direct current, which uh, Edison. And so what we're looking at is the Chicago World's Fair 
And this, this, these pictures are the first time that most Americans ever saw electrical lighting. The Westinghouse Corporation, who had hired Tesla away from Edison, pro produced Tesla's alternating current lighting system. They built a power generation facility on the grounds of the World's Fair, and they put thousands and thousands of electrical light bulbs everywhere on, on that. And it was one of the, you know, to, it was just earth altering. Okay, now we're gonna get in directly into the thing that's going to influence your choices in your lighting system today. Now I'm gonna tell you, besides these incandescent lights and the fluorescent lights that we all deal with in our homes, and we're, we're all familiar with light bulbs and, and fluorescent tubes. But there's many, many other kinds of lighting in, in the world. In fact, just a little aside here, is all these, in, in 1880, the city of Paris, France, was already electrified on their, they had electrical streets. They're called the city of light. What they did is they took giant carbon rods, basically the same type lighting system. We've all seen searchlights used in the night sky for advertisement. They put in a set of street lights that were electrically powered. Those, those were, we still use those today. They're phenomenal, they're impressive. We still use a lot of cool lighting systems today from early on, like neon. I see a neon building in the right of this picture on the right. But uh, those arc lighting, those carbon arc lighting, they're used in the motion picture industry still today. They're used in search lights. Uh, when I was a teenager, they were used, they were used in drive-in theaters because you had to have an enormous amount of light to uh, illuminate one of those giant drive-in screens. But what it amounted to, it was just, it was the same principle as a welding rod. That stuff was so bright, you had to wear welding goggles to set those lights up, and they had carbon, two carbon rods that were driven by motors with electrical current and a giant arc created in the open atmosphere. Of course, it was enclosed in the machine, but it wasn't in some kind of a controlled gas. It was in uh, the regular atmosphere. So as time went on in uh, highway systems and the roadways of the 20th century uh, were built out, there were a lot of other type lighting systems. Cut back to me, Sandy, if you would, on the camera. I'm gonna, I found one of these in our supply closet. This is a, this is a mercury vapor light, I think that it's probably something that we use out in the, the shop uh, in one of the industrial lighting systems, but it's, it's, not, it's not the same type of lighting s system that's used in a residence, it's got, and it's, it's a light you might use uh, the street lamps outside, that sort of thing, but um, so that one of the types of, of exotic, what would could the average consumer be considered an exotic electric light would be sodium vapor. Now, if you go back to the slides, so that, that picture on the left is sodium, sodium vapor lighting, and that's what the whole world has been until very recently. And there has been, I mean, just within, oh, I actually know the dates, but in the last 10 years, there's been a, a very profound switch to LED light emitting diode lighting uh, such as we see it left. And one of the characteristics of the old lighting systems, the sodium vapor street lights that you see on the left picture in this frame, is that its spectral characteristics are actually pretty horrible. I mean, they were going for light output so that cars could see each other. Uh, they wanted, uh, it's not, it's, there was nothing about light accuracy. I think there was probably a side benefit, that horrible yellow light, if you've ever seen a bug light, probably didn't draw as many bugs. Uh, but the, uh, the LED lighting, unlike Thomas Edison's filament lighting, let me just tell you what, what, the, what the issue was. Uh, Thomas Edison, I won't go into what his original patents uh, covered because all the, the, uh, the light bulbs that we're familiar with, cut, cut back to me, I'm going I'm to be jumping back and forth quite a bit, Sandy. 
But all the light bulbs that we've, we've known all of our lives have a filament, a high resistance wire inside this envelope that's made out of the metal tungsten. And someplace on my notes I wrote something down. I've, I'm sure I've lost it. But, but think back to that picture that I showed at, on the forge. On the forge. And when I say, oh, something... Until, until fluorescent lights and light-emitting diodes came along, I made the point a little bit ago that light is related to heat. If you heat a piece of metal or particular types of metals hot enough, they're going to glow. They're going to emit light. And that's what, that's what these bulbs do. So ultimately, you can't heat the filament of a tungsten light. If you, if you heat a piece of steel over uh, just a little way, um, this, is, this is probably the key concept I'm hoping to introduce everybody to today as far as the science and how to talk about lighting because we need to do away with some terms that we've all, that we've all come to use. These cool white, soft light, let me grab one of these. Oh, I should have got one with full tubes. But back in the day of our Edison bulbs and everything, we've seen those markings on there that says cool white or soft white. That didn't change the underlying technology in there. It meant that they were changing dyes or they were just working in a very limited way. Because the fact is, if you heated that wire up hot enough to be white, actual white, then it, the bulb wouldn't last but a second. It would just blow out or whatever would happen. So, so there were different, so the melting point, we talk, we're going to talk about a term, what it is. It's color temperature, but it's actually real temperature. But it's, unfortunately, it's not Fahrenheit, which we're all used to in our daily lives in, here in, in uh, the United States. But, you know, there's, there's, there's uh, two primary um, temperature scales in the world. One is Fahrenheit, which we're all familiar with, but we're the, we're the, uh, we're the outliers on that. The, pretty much the whole world uses Celsius. And the Celsius scale means where water freezes, that's zero, not 32 degrees. Where water freezes, that's zero on the Celsius scale. And where water boils is 100 on the Celsius scale. So they're both systems of increments, but the increments in Celsius are, are much coarser so that there's uh, the, same, the same scale where we've got a 100 degree change between uh, water freezing to ice and boiling, 100 degrees, 100 increments on scale. In, in Fahrenheit, there's 180 degrees, so it's, it's more, more resolution. Okay, so there's a third scale in the world, but it's, the, the third scale is actually Celsius as well. It's the same increment system. And that, and that scale, that temperature scale, is called Kelvin. Um, and Kelvin, the only difference between Celsius and Kelvin is instead of zero, the zero point being the freezing point of water, on the Celsius, on, on the Kelvin scale, zero is set at absolute zero, meaning all mole molecular motion stops. It's so cold that the electrons stop circling the atoms. So uh, there's, there are no negative degrees Kelvin because there is nothing, there is nothing colder um, than absolute zero. By the way, this is just an aside. Those guys down at NASA testing space crafts, they can, on Earth, can get temperatures in a room down in Houston uh, within a few tenths of a degree from absolute zero material science. Okay, so, so we're gonna learn, we're gonna learn things and, and this, is, this is what I hope that you take away from this is to stop using this word here, this cool white, soft white, whatever, those are marketing phrases. They don't really mean anything. They don't, a cool white from one to, from a Sylvania light to an Osram light to a General Electric bulb, 
one brand to another, it doesn't even mean the same thing. It's a marketing thing. What means something is this thing right here that says Kelvin. And so you need to learn to talk Kelvins and dispense with all this confusing and, and uh, uh, co co confusing information. The, um, if you're talking Kelvin, you're talking real science. And so guys like me, it's real easy to get very comfortable with it. And in the Kelvin world, for the applications that we're talking about, you basically only need to really think about two things, two temperatures. So, so, so those temperatures are um, our traditional light bulb, this Edison bulb, this thing runs at about 2,800 degrees Kelvin. That tungsten filament will go that hot. And the reason it had to be tungsten, if you took that piece of iron that we saw on the forge, uh, that, that steel can melt as low as 1,600 degrees. Well, 1,600 degrees, we saw how red that, that light was. I mean, it looked a little white because it was, that's an artifact of the photographic process. It, just, it was just too bright for the camera. But if you were there with your naked eye, you'd see that it's like red. Uh, that's how warm at 1,600 degrees Kelvin you are, and that's the melting temperature of anything that would be made from iron or steel would be in that range. The tungsten wire inside this fixture, tungsten has a melting temperature of 3,422 degrees Kelvin. What that tells me is, and, and just for reference, we call daylight two numbers. Remember two numbers. 3,000 is the color of light we've all been used to from this light bulb for all our lives, 3,000 degrees Kelvin. 5,000 degrees Kelvin is actual white light that comparable to what you would see outside at noon sunlight. So what's happened now is a designer of your home and pick your colors because, because now, thanks to the technology today, is light is no longer associated with heat. And that's a good thing because anytime you in the past had a light bulb that was hot, that heat represented wasted energy, pure and simple. That, that heat was not producing light, it was just being thrown away. So that uh, to make this thing make light, you know, like 95% of the electricity that was put in this bulb was just simply thrown away, wasted as heat. That's not the case with these, with these um, modern LED or light emitting diode fixtures. And the other thing is, um, we never, it was not a tungsten fil filament lamp, it was never possible to make that thing closer to white than 3,400 degrees Kelvin because the wire inside would literally melt. In fact, it became so fragile when it got hotter they, didn't never, they never pushed it that far. That's the reason it was 2,800 to give a margin of safety so that our, lights, our light bulbs lasted longer and, and all that. So it would just been, you know, we've had to replace bulbs all the time anyway. So, okay, in your home, this studio that we're in here, this room, uh, I'll cover some stuff uh, with Satterwhite. Let's talk about the aesthetics, aesthetics of lighting your home because a residential space is different than a commercial space. And I've made some lighting choices in this part of the building particularly, but I think most everybody around here knows I'm on the war path right now. But this is a commercial building. We're, we're here in the, in the daytime. Um, and so in broad daylight, you like your eyes to match what's going on outside. Just like at night, uh, driving down the highway, we've, you know, it's real annoying when people buy those blue headlamps. Uh, that's, that's kind of blinding. So putting the wrong light color in the wrong place is like a bad thing. And uh, so, <clears throat> so I've got, I cut out the box after I installed LED lighting that's been retrofitted to work in fluorescent, the existing fluorescent fixtures in the building here. And so this is a, I, again, I don't like this cool bluish white. I don't like it called bluish. 
This, this is not. When you're at 5,000 degrees, 5,500 degrees, that range, that's, that's real daylight. There is another stat someplace on when you shop for lighting systems, there is another specification on here. I mean, this is just something from Lowe's or Home Depot, and this is, this is a contractor. Uh, uh, I've, got, I've got some other, there is another, another, one other thing. There's just three things you need to know about light. And the one is the degrees Kelvin, which is, which you can, affects the color of it. That tells the color temperature. And then the lumens, which is how bright it is. And I don't have any guidance on that. You can just compare yourself. Yeah, I've, I've been using this light bulb and it's had this many lumen. And if I put in this LED fixture, it's got the same rating, so it'll be just as bright. It's that simple. And the third, the third rating is something called CRI, or Color Rendering Index. So I deal with these, I deal with lighting professionally all the time. And Color Rendering Index is where, where it would be revealed that a fluorescent tube is horrible. And that is, if you take the light produced by this bulb, whatever it may be, and you compare it to real white light, how close a match is it? Even if it's the right color, uh, I mean, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a telephone call. It's a, we all know that tinny sound of the old fashioned, or even our cell phones is pretty horrible. Well, that's not like somebody whispering in your ear, is it? So, uh, so you can have the right color temperature and still have horrible light because the fixture has a low color rendering index rating. So in a perfect world, you'd really like your color rendering index to be upwards of 90. So <clears throat> too much, too much information. But anyway, you can do, you know, it doesn't cost any more to buy, to buy a, uh, a, a 5,000 degree fluorescent fixture than it does to buy, just to just go in and buy whatever fits and just mix them and, and you, all your lights are different colors. But it makes a huge difference depending on what you're intending to do. If you are, if you are, if you have a library and if you love books, if you love reading, if you have a special chair and lamp that you want to sit under, then you, you want that closer to real white, not that yellow stuff. And particularly as you get older, uh, I'm, I'm got a lot more information I'm going to go into here today, but it is an absolute fact that as we age, our, our eyes need more and more light. And so you need, you're going to need brighter light as you age. If you do, uh, if I was building a shop, a lot, of, a lot of people build adjoining shops and workshop areas, and you're going to be, you know, your guy, if you like woodwork or whatever the case may be, uh, you want 5,000 Kelvin lights in that shop. For sure. Uh, here at Sutter White Log Homes, I want 5,000 Kelvin lights pretty much in the whole building. The weird thing is, is in that office in Ella J, not so much because the upper two floors of that are a residence. And so I don't, the light selections that have been made over there, you know, I, don't act like I'm in control of all this all the time, so I don't really know what bulbs they're buying, but if I was over there, the, uh, the, the residential model area would be lit like a home, and the office areas would be at 5,000 Kelvin. If I've got to have people in workspaces and that kind of thing, it's going to be easier in our eyes. None of us are getting any younger. Okay, let's go back to the slides. I'm, I, I'm probably all backwards. I know I am. I'm going <clears> to... <throat> So I was on a live stream yesterday and the guy went an hour and a half. That could happen. But I don't know. You know, I wrote this presentation. I stayed up almost all night and I finished it 10 minutes before showtime. It's not like I rehearsed. So I'm going to tell you about a guy that you've all seen his work. He's a celebrity photographer. Uh, I've met him several times. This is some of his work. That's the sad story there in it. Uh, he has some great stories about this stuff. Uh, Vincent LaFore on the left. This is a guy who is, uh, he's a, this is a great title. You, when you get the Canon sponsored photography, the Canon camera company, they are called Explorers of Light. 
And uh, it isn't about the glass, it isn't about the camera, and you know, don't talk to me about what the best camera in the world. I'm gonna tell you what, real photographers, they talk about real light first and that emotional power that it carries. The next thing they'll talk about is lenses. And then the, the last thing they talk about, who cares about whatever camera hangs off the back of the lens that you need to use for something? So uh, if y'all come to seminar and come talk to me, don't, don't be talking that stuff about what's the best camera because, because I, I'm not good enough to use the brownie that I got when I was 12 years old. I've, but anyway, Vincent Lafore, he's watching what happened. And we showed that streetlight scene a little bit ago. And I was saying how compelling the economics of, of light emitting diodes, light em LED lighting are that the cities and the commercial spaces of the entire world, he travels a lot. He saw that going on. He does a lot of aerial work. He was watching this happen from helicopters. And he gets the bright idea, man, this is, this is, uh, he went to like 12 of the great cities of the world and rented helicopters for like a week and he would fly around. You can buy his book called Air on Amazon and it's a fabulous book. And it, it shows what happens when the cities of the world start converting to full spectrum LED lighting. And he went at that moment, he said deliberately, where you can still see part of the lighting grid there, still yellow soda, sodium vapor. But, but just his, his work is phenomenal. Uh, by the, look at those highways down there where we're actually getting true color with, as LED lighting comes on. These are the kind of design choices available to you in your log home or any other home at really no extra cost today. Just be aware of it, just be aware of it. So, just gorgeous stuff. Color temperature of light. Okay, I, I think I just jumped the gun and talked about this all uh, earlier, but you know, to forget those old terms like soft white, which are meaningless, uh, and learn to think of light in the real terms. Kelvin degrees that, do, uh, uh, that, that comparable to a piece of metal that can be, that can be heated until it's white hot. 3,000 Kelvin, that range is your, your traditional residential lighting color. 5,000, those are the two mat. 3,000, 5,000. 5,000, you're dealing in the realm of true white light. 3,000, you're, you're in the realm of a warm light. Now, I think you can see where this is going a little bit because I didn't say that white light was the best thing for log homes. When we were looking at those winter scenes or those homes, that warmth of hearth and home, all this language that we've got with lighting, but these memories and these things, the emotion, we don't, we don't verbalize it. We, don't, we just know when thing is just perfect. Um, so, and when things are not perfect, we have other language. We say, oh, it's harsh or glare, or this light is clinical. Um, you know, it's not flattering. Um, but, but we know, we know those, those, think of the best picture you've got. Oh, the, that's just gorgeous. And that part of that gorgeous is that lighting. It's arresting. We see a picture, that beautiful picture outdoors, or, and it's just breathtaking. We see golden sunsets. We see copper tone tans. We see the flicker of fireplaces. We have dr dreamy. Uh, we know these things. We just need to, we don't verbalize them. We watch the movies and, and, the, and I'm, I'm so crazy about this stuff is uh, because I get a, a well-made movie. I'm just like anybody else. I can be interested in the camera work and I can be interested in the lighting and all the craft going on. And if the movie's really good, you can't make yourself think about that. You get drawn emotionally into that story and you're lost. So guys like me, yeah, we, we, watch, we watch the movies or rewatch movies with the sound turned off so that we can pay attention to what's going on because those guys in Hollywood, they are masterful. So I've got some, okay, hey, I'm, I'm about through this. I, maybe, who knows. Um, 
here's some tips. Here's some tips. When you're thinking about the lighting and seeing your home in a new light, you want to avoid mixed sources within a single space. Don't just go buy the bulb that fits. Now that we've got full spectrum lighting available, it can be confusing. I, I cannot stand to go to the grocery store because, I mean, like, I wanted the tube of Crest, and look, there's 20,000 different flavors of toothpaste, you know, all the, I don't know about all that stuff, so it's frustrating. So, but it doesn't need to be frustrating when you make your lighting choices. Because when you have your plans from our designers, mark your plans up. Think about how those living spaces are going to be used. Uh, let me just, I mean, choose a color palette and a lighting design for your home and stick to it. And then I've already mentioned that age is a factor, but how do you pick a lighting scheme for your home? You know, there's the aesthetics and everything, but consider the day part. What part of time of the day will you be using this area of the home? If your living room, if you're gonna sit in, in in the evenings and you know that light's a certain color outside, you know, I think that 3000 Kelvin range fixtures is right for a whole lot of things. But a lot of areas in the home, like say, say you love quilting and you've got a loft in your house. I've seen a lot of ladies do this as, I, as I've photographed homes and they'll, have, they'll set up a quilting loft and a workspace, needlepoint, whatever. Well, 5000K, true white, true accurate lighting is great for that because for one thing, uh, the detail work involved and the visibility and being able to see things clearly with our eyes, that's great. But like all of us, your grandkids come to visit. And I'm going to tell you, when they stay up late, 11 o'clock at night, and, they're, and they've got pallets on the, they've got all your quilts on the floor by then, and all the cousins are going to spend the night talking, well, you know, that, that 5,000 watt pure daylight isn't all that beautiful at that hour of the night. So uh, I'm not going to get into specific brands, because how could we? I mean, I'm talking too much anyway, but the, the bicolor, you might consider lighting your home uh, in two different lighting systems uh, so that you could have a dimmer lesson. Let me see, working with contractors, I think I, whoa. Okay, so we're all, hey, we're almost through this. That's good news for like, I think there's one person watching, two people on Facebook. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, probably that step up from doing something on uh, and picking something and having made a hard choice. I want to show you something real quick that we did here in the office just so that you'll appreciate. I have a whole, let's switch back to the camera, Sandy. I'm sitting here holding on to these, this box of tubes, lighting tubes, like you wouldn't believe. I'll probably drop it and we all know what fluorescents do when they break. There'll be phosphors everywhere. So, When you're a photographer like me, you got some weird stuff around. I'll, I'll show you this. Here's an Edison. Let me hold this over where it's, mm, where's this go? Over here. Yeah. This is an Edison. This is our light bulb we all know. This is a mogul-based bulb, bulb. Sometimes you'll see this if, if you're uh, at an antique store or something like that because this Edison, there were other, there were other things. And, and the mogul, base, which is like a supersized Edison, it's still in use out there. Uh, but usually in, in fact, this, uh, this shop light that I showed earlier, that's a mogul based bow. Most consumers don't encounter this stuff. Uh, there are track lights or another thing that have been popular now and then. Track lights used a type of lighting, which is a type of incandescent light. It uses a filament uh, called a quartz light. And quartz uses a special enclosure glass around that filament so that the filament can burn hotter. And what happens, uh, these, these lights are, there again, they're hot lights. They burn at an incredible temperature uh, where they will, boy, I have just brushed one and blistered my finger horribly. But, but they're burning so hot that that metal filament inside that bulb actually vaporizes. So they're called quartz because that glass enclosure is specially 
was specially created so that it will not bond with vaporized metal inside. So when the light cools, that vaporized metal, there's no place for it to re-adhere except for back on the filament itself, which makes the uh, quartz light uh, last much longer. They weren't practical. That's, that was the innovation was the glass. But you can get the same, a lot of fixtures out there in the real world, you can get them with the same, so that you can swap out your old hot lights and replace them with, <coughs> excuse me, with LEDs, which are much cooler. You can run, you can run like dozens of LED lights on, the, on a lighting circuit and with the same draw as a single quartz light. It's incredible. One thing that I'm glad to have seen go away, I didn't have the consumer version of this, but I've got lots of professional, these hideous things. <coughs> For one thing, they're fluorescent, and uh, fluorescent light is ugly light, unless, unless you do some, I've got professional fluorescent lamps, they're beautiful, but you guys aren't gonna spend that, never. In, the, in a home to do what it takes to make fluorescent behave. So these are gone in good riddance because it, they were ugly for one thing, man. They, they just looked horrible inside of a lamp or something. So we do have, finally, LED light bulbs that look, look attractive again and we can put them in our ceiling fans and, places where you can see them uh, that we just wouldn't do with those uh, compact fluorescent lights. I'll tell you what, this will be the comedy section. I'll take, I'll take five seconds for, so, this, is, this is Crocodile Dundee of lights. If you wanna say, hey, that's not a knife, that's not a fluorescent light, this is a fluorescent light. Put that in your lamp. It's weird stuff. But you can get these fluorescents in all, in all sizes. Not fluorescents, excuse me. If you've got existing uh, fluorescent fixtures in your under counter lighting, you can now replace those with LEDs. And when you go to the LEDs, you get a, a, a light that's gonna have a far superior color rendering index. It's gonna be accurate. And you can also chain, uh, uh, choose the color temperature of, a, of the LED bulb to match your lighting scheme. There's other, other types. This is another, uh, you know, a thin tube uh, fluorescent. So again, you can go down to the store and you can buy these in an LED uh, as readily as you can. You can, the old, uh, all, a lot of our homes have can lights in them, various sizes. We, this is, I basically, uh, looted the supply closet at Cedar White like two o'clock this morning to show some of these things. So we've got we've got all that. Oh, I don't want to break any. So we just remodeled our lobby and out with the old, in with the new, and it turns out that the fixtures that were in our lobby were LED already because Oh, I forgot to do something in the slideshow, but I, I, I'll just simulate this a little bit. Let me throw this down. <clears throat> when you're designing, let's talk new construction for a minute. When you're designing your home and working with our designers, um, most Satterwhite homes use uh, engineered roof trusses extensively because, because they're stronger and they're less expensive and it fits in with conventional building practices. So we, we've always taken these to our seminars and showed this is like a little model truss. So the problem, if you were doing this, and I don't have an actual two by four, but let's take another example, something with a, with a, um, a loft, a truss, because we do a lot of this. A lot of our plans have upper floors inside the attic structure, so that you'll have stairs come up here this is called a bottom cord, and uh, so you'll, you can have a bed and all kinds of things up inside this house. Underneath here someplace, you're going to have a support inside this, the, the plan. You'll be over a hallway or some other kind of room or maybe, a, you know, whatever the room layout is downstairs. But 
but just this distance between your upper floor and your the roof of the lower floor. So that's been a challenge in lighting. So in, in say if there's a hallway down here, you might have had to put um, sconces or something on the walls, something. But thanks to these kind of fixtures, not maybe this one, this is an older, I don't, this has been up in our uh, lobby for years and years uh, before this remodel. This one, if you look at it, it's too deep. A normal can light, oh, which would, you know, you can tell from the, of course, this is an actual size, but if, if you had the full fixture and everything, this bulb would be too deep. You couldn't mount that kind of a light fixture in a recessed fixture inside that. Well, when we came in with the remodel at Satterwhite of our lobby, this is the, the new the new lighting fixtures that we chose. I'm trying not to cut my finger on these metal pieces. I don't want to bleed on camera. I mean, I, I don't do special effects movies. So you can tell from this, this box um, that this, is, this, this, this light is wafer thin. It can, I read the specification on it, and it can be mounted in any space that's one and a half inches deep. It can, uh, it's LED, it runs cool, it can be in contact with insulation and other materials. It's, it's you know, it's not a fire hazard. And this, this is the, the exact lights that we put in our, our new lobby remodel. I bought a few spares because even though they're rated to last 17 years, they probably will. This particular brand is Eaton. And when you buy lights like this at your lighting supply house, look at how thin that is. I mean, it's, it's really this is a little spring clip just to hold it up there. But the light itself is barely thicker than one finger. Let me get that right edge on. It's amazing. There is no bulb in this. So there, it, there's, uh, you just put it up there and it's there. There is a little ballast unit which you know, converts our 110 electricity. Now this is, this is the part, Sandy, where I'm gonna wanna go to the close-up camera on that number two. I wanna show you something about this and this is this is uh, because these you can buy these things. Getting back to this, three thousand degrees Kelvin color temperature is what we're used to in our homes. Five thousand Kelvin is daylight, a white light of outside daylight. But these these little fix, fixtures are fascinating in that what what is you can buy them at a fixed color temperature. You better pay attention if you do that. You better be confident in your choice. In our case, um, and we'll talk, this will be the, I'll sum up on something in a minute, but I had exactly 45 minutes to make because the electrician was there and he was about to install something. So I had 45 minutes to drive to the local lighting supply house and make a selection. I, was, I knew that I wanted 5,000 degree lights, but they didn't have them in stock. That's because residential lighting what those guys are going to stock is most residential lighting is 3,000 degrees. That's what makes sense for them to keep inventory. So these things, I think, I think the fixed color temperature lights were 17 or 18 dollars each, and this one was about three dollars more. But this is super interesting. The difference in this one is is this one has inside the the illumination piece here, it has two separate sets of LEDs. One of them is at, oh, I can tell you exactly what it is, 2700 degrees Kelvin, which is a very warm light. And the other, the other set of LEDs in here is 5000 degrees daylight, which is true, li true light. So it has a little switch here on the case. With the electrician installing, there's a little, and they put five positions on there and it's kind of like a mixer. 
So if you put it at 2700 degrees, it just turns on just the 2700 degree LEDs in here. But if you put it on 5000, just the 5000 degree LEDs, and then you've got three intermediate steps if you want to choose something in between. Again, pick your color temperature, but, but be aware if you select one of these oddball ones like 4000 degrees Kelvin or something, you're going to almost automatically put yourself in the position of having mixed source because you're not going to be able to find a LED lamp for your table lamp that's at 4000 degrees. So I would say choose something at 3000 degrees, set this switch so that it's consistent in your space so that you're not mixing sources. Mixing sources, um, I'll just, I'll make my little speech about this because you're going to, and we're, and it's a, it's a bit of a transition into the final topic that I wanted to address today anyway, and that is working with your contractors and subcontractors. Um, let's, let's jump back to the slides. I think I had that one slide in there. Mm, input six. There we are. So, the beautiful thing like the, about this light that I showed you that we put in our own office is you can choose your light. And actually, if you decided that you made a bad choice, if they're only $3 a, a light more. And if you, just, if you didn't like what that house looked like, well, you could get somebody up there on a ladder. They're real easy to take out. Um, and uh, switch back to me for a second. I forgot to show something here. Like the bezel, the bezel on this. So these, these things are, come with a paintable bezel. So our current, we took this light and the electrician had a can of Rust-Oleum. And so, you know, these things are, are ready for contractor installation and they buy the water. So you can make this bezel any color you want to. It's a paintable surface. And this one was white originally too, but we just took the Rust-Oleum, matched it up. It looks beautiful against the, uh, I think we got blue stain Ponderosa. It looks great. It looks great. He did a great job on that. So if you have this, if you spend $3 extra for a light where it's, it's got both sets of LEDs in there, you could real quick, it's just spring clipped. It's not even screwed on or anything. It's a simple, simple, simple thing to pop them out, change the color temperature. You could, you could rethink that choice just as easy as you wanted to. I think these were like $21 a piece. It's, a, it's amazing, amazing. I don't even want to tell you what professional lights cost. Okay. So I haven't done a comprehensive, I'm not a residential lighting guy. I work in you know, photography and film, and so I deal, I deal with a lot of bicolor lights, um, which <clears throat> I got a little bit misgivings away because usually, usually I want all the light I can get, so I choose one, one or the other. Um, but somebody out there in the residential space may make something that is bicolor. And in fact, this, these lights that I just show you are switch selectable, so they are bicolor. But when I say bicolor, what would be awesome is if you shopped around, somebody might have one where you could switch it without digging, going up on a ladder or pulling the fixture. So, uh, I know that such systems, is, I'm not, I'm, I just don't think that, that that exists at that, you know, $17, $18 uh, uh, fixture price. Uh, this is where, until now, we've been talking about a set of lights that, that don't cost you any more money, but you get, you have that emotional control of your living space uh, the same as, as you would with... Uh, yeah, it's a decorating choice, the color of your light. So that's what, one of the things, and this is my segue into the final thing I wanted to talk about, because uh, I guarantee you there's not a painter in the world who doesn't understand dealing with a lady customer finishing her house that her color choices matter. If she picks, well, What's my, my color vocabulary is not sufficient. But uh, if she picks a color, she means to have that color. And all painters understand that. But, 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 here's the, here's the truth. 
almost no electrician working in the world today understands he's painting with light. And it doesn't matter to him one bit. All he wants to see is light coming out of it. So you're going to have to pay attention to that. Um, he's not going to. He's not going to be concerned with mixing sources or painting this color or that color with one fixture. Uh, he's, he's used to, make, well, you can, you, know, you can buy a different set of bulbs if you want to fix that. Those guys, um, I mean, it's just, it's not in their vocabulary just yet. And I'm not saying that to ding electricians. I'm saying that because, I mean, the final thing that I wanted to, you know, Sam Satterwhite, when he, you know, building a house and building a log house, I mean, this is a dream home. It should be, it can be the worst experience of your life or it can be the best experience of your life. We have so many customers who bring in their grandchildren because they don't tend to sell that house. They have those kids do something or touch that house and they build memories with their family. They, they, they intend to pass that home down on their family land and they intend that child and his children to have that house someday. So, but, but, um, Construction is a business just like anybody, anything else. At our seminars, Sam routinely, routinely asks people to say, uh, by a raise of hands, who here today is a lawyer? Who here today is for... He, ta he polls the audience, who's here from out of every state in the nation, he'll call them, but uh, asking who's who from different places. But one of those things that he'll see, he'll, he'll sometimes throw into that batch is, uh, who here is an architect? Who here is an engineer? That can sometimes cause problems because you've got to understand all these carpenters, the guys who work for us, man, they've been a carpenter and their dad was a carpenter and their grandfather was a carpenter and they do things the way they do things. They have relationships with vendors. They use, an, your electrician, he's going to have a relationship with electrical supply house. If you take off buying fixtures off Amazon, which is a bad idea, that's, that's going to that's gonna rock his boat. So the ideal thing is once you've decided on an electrician and you've got a feeling about this, is to ask him, which supply house do you use? And if you're going to design with light, and if you're going to think about this a little bit, you might be digging into the catalog because I, I saw brochures from like every major, there's so many companies in, in residential lighting, but Lutron is a, a brand name that, of uh, switches and fixtures and things I've heard a lot. So um, the problem with an engineer, and we, we run into this at times with the problem that our company has working with maybe an outside engineer, not so much, or an architect is running into somebody who knows the who thinks they know the log home business better than we do, and they have maybe some generic knowledge of another construction system, and they try to apply principles that they know from someplace else that are not appropriate for our materials, and we know that what they're wanting to do won't work. So, when you start rocking somebody's boat, what you want to do. Oh, what I put on that slide, if we cut back to the slides. I just said, you know, get along with your contractors and get along with their vendors. Don't get in between them and their vendors. Don't start specifying some exotic product that you read about on the internet, no matter how cool it may seem to be. Uh, if you start rocking their boat, you know, uh, an electrician, when he bids that job, he has... Uh, his electrician and their assistant, and if he planned for them to be there two days uh, to do like the electrician was here for our lobby, don't introduce some goofy thing that he doesn't understand and in the way he do th does things and bring it in from a vendor he doesn't deal with and he doesn't know who to call for help and, and put him in the position where he's going to have to work a week on a job that he expected to work two days. That's when you're going to have you're going to start having conflicts. And if you're, I mean, this is just this transition period into 
designing with light and thinking about light. So just be aware of their business needs. And, and also, when you start deep diving into, that, into that, uh, to the lighting contract uh, catalogs and looking at websites and lighting systems on the internet, understand that that lo local lighting house, uh, I mean, nobody can carry an inventory of every product in the world. Even their main lines, they won't carry every fixture. It's just, this is a vast area. So work way in advance. Start thinking about your lighting plan, even as our designers drawing your plans. And start thinking about that and looking at your fixtures and, and thinking about your color scheme that you want in your house. Think about it at that time, and once you've settled on something, be in touch with that electrical supply house. Now, our supplier on our electrical components of our new office was Elliott Electric Company. And they are, I think they've got about 140 stores clustered in Texas and surrounding states, but as far west as Arizona and as far east as Georgia. So, I mean, they're a great company. Uh, they, um, I tried to talk them into being in today's video, but I'll tell you, everybody I talk to has more sense than to do this, including me. It won't be me next week, <laughs> which you'll all thank me for. But um, so give those guys lead time. It's okay to do special orders, and it's, it's okay to be particular about what you want, want and to get what you want. And it's, and it's not unreasonable to expect not to pay a huge premium for getting what you want unless you disrupt the construction flow. And so when... One crew, you know, the carpenters that put, that put our blue stain ponderosa on the ceiling are finished. That electrician wants to be right behind them the next day to set the electrical fixtures. He had to be there before to make sure the wiring was in place. Then he wants to set the, the electrical fixtures the very next day after they're through because you've got a painter the next day. So don't rock your general contractors. Be respectful of this business, and, and, and uh, it's only just be reasonable. Reasonable. Work with your people. And, I mean, it's not lighting school. I got into a lot of I showed you those early pictures at the beginning of the show today about me on film careers. Boy, you know, I was a college kid, and uh, that, that I, worked on a, I worked on a film called Wind Walker, and that was right at when Mount St. Helens blew. And there was, that caused some difficulties because it was about some mystical Indian chief and he rides off into the sunset in the snowy tops of the mountains. And we went, I was on the crew that went on the second unit, you know, second unit photographer, cinematographer. And I went with him and boy, that was thrilling to me to be on a real movie. And, and uh, we had the uh, uh, Indian actor there and the huge uh, caped, with a wolf head over his, and he's on his horse, and we're all up in the mountains of uh, high mountain, Utah, Uinta specifically, deep snow, and, uh, and boy, I was, I was so passionate about cameras, and we were working with an Airy 35BL, which I had never seen before. And those old film cameras, okay, well, you're dealing with some issues up there because the batteries are cold, they're not putting out enough ju juice, Cameras are mechanical devices, not electronic. They have film in them. And so the camera actually has a tachometer on it. And when you start rolling that shot, you need to check that tack to make sure that the camera is up to speed and operate. And when the batteries are cold and they don't have, you're having problems. That cinematographer had, had issues on his mind. And not the least of which, this was the sun going down and we had a window of just minutes to get the, the final shot of the movie. And here's, here's this dumb college kid, Danny Grizzle, asking camera questions about the Airy 35BL. And he listened to me for about 15 seconds, and he looked over at me and he says, this isn't film school. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if you, if you spend a ton of time and read everything there is to know about residential lighting, um, 
on the internet. Don't be that guy that goes to your contractor whose dad was a contractor, whose father before him and grandfather before him, and start putting him through lighting school, okay? Just make this as easy on everybody as you possibly can, and you'll have a, and you should have, make it a wonderful experience for them too because uh, it's a new world. We have these new fixtures that are available to us, and it's good for all of us to learn and grow. And so including them, even if they might be a little resistant or they might be comfortable, you know, I've seen too many, we've all seen that sign, haven't we? Uh, my hourly fee, $20. If you want to help, $40. Don't be that guy. So, uh, you know, be good, to you. be good to the guys that you hire. Uh, you know, we always love it when the customers cook barbecue for our crews on the last day and stuff like that. But only if we make you happy. And we, may, we aim to make you happy. And, you know, that's, hey, I'm not pushing that. But that sure is nice. Hey, what else do I need to say here? Let's go back to, oh, I, do, I got one, one final thing. Uh, okay, I think I, I'm, I've made all these points here. I've, avoid, I, I had a warning in here that kind of, I didn't know where to put it in this. So one thing about these LEDs is you, you, uh, when I say don't mix sources and don't mix lighting systems, you, on a retrofit, and there's a lot of products out there in, in uh, LED lighting that are designed as best they can to work with if you're doing a remodel of your house so that you just like screw one out and you screw the LED in. And that pretty much works until, until you get into the subject of dimmers. And dimmers are important, man. You, you, yeah, there's time. If you want to sit out on the porch and have that cup of coffee before dawn and watch the sun come up and you want just that low light, you want dimmers. And the technology, the technology of a dimmer that was designed for a tungsten filament lamp is not the same dimmer that's going to work optimally with an LED which Sam and Travanda Sederwhite discovered at their home by putting in LED lamps on, you know, the dimmers. And I'm going to tell you, bad things happen. I mean, it's not like a fire or anything, but, those, but your lights can start popping like popcorn. And your TV, they enter, bad things can happen. So think about not just in terms of color, but that one special case. And the dimmers for LEDs sometimes have to be purpose-built for the system of LEDs. For instance, um, because, because this is an electronic relationship, the dimmer is made by the manufacturer for the specific LED when you get into the better systems. Uh, they're not the fudge it, we'll try to make it work. But if you're really into the good stuff, it's, they're going to be made for each other. Well, there's complications because we all know that we like a switch by the door coming in and we like a switch by the hall going out the rest of the house. And these electronic dimmer systems, that's not simple like the old analog light bulb days. So you have to think about all those things in advance. And go talk to your lighting, uh, your lighting supply house. I didn't know this. I'd never set foot in an Elliott Electric before... Uh, I actually asked their uh, regional manager on the phone the day before yesterday. I says, are y'all trade only or are the public welcome to walk in here? No, you're, well, you're totally welcome. If you're building a home and you're thinking about these things, uh, go in there and let them put you through lighting school. Don't, don't uh, torture your, your uh, electrician with all that stuff. Uh, they, they represent these products and, and they're, they'll be pretty ex excited to share with you what they know. Uh, some of these things, the more uh, high-end lighting systems, you know, not everybody, none of us learn everything all at once. Um, I, I sometimes stand around some place like Best Buy, and there's some kid in there who's 17 years old or 16 with his first job, and, and uh, some customer will come in there and ask him some question about nuclear physics, like, like he's involved with the design team on the stuff he sells, you know. And, and here's the thing that never changes. He will give them an answer. <laughs> so, you know, hey, read the internet too. But, but uh, yeah, kind of study and be careful about that stuff. So dimmers are a special, a special case. What else? Let's go back to the slides. I had one final thing here. 
you know, this is saying the same thing. Have all components on hand in advance. Like I said, these, these fixtures in our lobby, I made the, the, the uh, fixture choice 45 minutes before they were being installed. Don't let, be aware of those construction workflows. That's just the way we operate here at Satterwhite, okay? Do, do as we say, not as we do. But, uh, you know, we had, to, we, we had to go with something that's in stock, all those kind of things. So, so work with lead time. Uh, think through these issues like color temperature and dimmer circuits in advance. Now, I'm going to show you the, the cutting edge of residential lighting. It's very expensive today. It's probably not for anybody building a house that's not in the million, you know, above that million dollar threshold at least. But uh, just like the lighting equipment that I'm using here in the studio and, and everywhere else, these products are coming down in price and sometimes like dramatically. So I looked at a system and there, I was told by uh, the, the regional manager at Elliott Electric that there are many, many, many brands of this, of this same concept. This is like the Tesla automobile of, lot, of residential lighting now. But, um, and I didn't, I didn't get any, uh, the brand, that, the retail brand, let me stop this. The retail brand name that I picked up on because I think I saw some, I've, I think I've already seen them in Sam's Club. Do that if you're doing a do-it-yourselfer. Don't do that to your electrician. Deal with his vendor and his supply house so he'll have somebody to call for help. He won't be talking to the 17-year-old stock guy at, at uh, Sam's Club to find out how to do his job. <laughs> um, but um, there's a new kind of, of uh, switch back to me for a second. I really am going to wrap this up, folks. We've gone way too long. All this lighting stuff, lighting, light has frequency. I brought, I brought some of our home. Here's our Satterwhite DVD. You know, DVDs are gone, dead and gone, just like Blockbuster Video, but we've still got them for you. And I'm the guy trying to do away with that. Hey, put it all on YouTube, but we've still got them. Uh, but we all know that DVDs came along. I brought a DVD that we have around our house. And, and then later on, we, we got high-definition televisions, high-definition, and then we got Blu-ray disc. You've heard of Blu-ray, haven't you, Sandy? What's the difference? Well, the, difference, the real difference is standard definition was our old-fashioned televisions that we all grew up with, and it was standard definition. It didn't, it didn't have much picture resolution, and so that was the first thing that came along, and it just so happened, these, these, are, these DVDs and Blu-rays, these are optical discs. They are read by light, by light rays, by a laser. And that laser is powered by an LED, a light-emitting diode, the same as these lighting systems in our house. And the first, commercial, the first commercial LEDs happened to be red lasers. And red light has a frequency uh, infrared or whatever, a very long wave, and it, it burned the optical pits on these things. They're big, so this will hold a movie. But when high-definition television came out, which has exactly four times as much picture quality as a standard definition, is that right? That might not be true. But anyway, vast improvement. Guess what? Those red LEDs of a DVD couldn't hold all that increased capacity in data necessary for a movie. So by then, though, technology, LED technology had come along that the scientist guys or whatever had invented blue LEDs. And blue LEDs are a much shorter, smaller wavelength, which means they could pack a lot more data on that same optical disc. That's what blue ray that's what Blu-ray is. So it is, but anyway, all these LEDs and full spectrum and high color rendering index, you know, this has been a continuous development process. So you get into a lot of color theory and everything. So we got, oh, we got red LEDs and blue, L, blue and there's green LEDs. And so, and then they got good at making these things so that the color rendering is great and the dimmability is great 
And so what became possible, this is just now possible. And it's, it is the leading edge product and it is expensive, like all brand new stuff is. But you can expect to see RGB, red, green, blue, LEDs in residential lighting. In fact, there's probably a dozen brands on the market already. And if you're building that level of house, you know who you are. If you're that customer and if you're that discriminating and you've got the budget to explore that kind of thing, it's a beautiful thing. So I don't have a, I, the, the brand name that I knew, know is Philip Hugh, but like I said, the guy at Elliott Electric, he, he actually preferred other brands. And I think you ought to go with the brands that what, somebody like Elliott's gonna carry basically anything on the market, I, I believe. Um, but the thing that I did have is just as a little eye candy here at the end, this is uh, from the production industry for photographers or whatever. This is an, LED, uh, an RGB fixture. And when you get into these systems, I mean, any of you have ever been around, this is not a film industry thing as much, but if you do guys who do concerts or theatrical lighting or stage lighting, they work with a, uh, a lighting control protocol system called DMX. Some of these, some of these um, multi-spectrum, we're not, we're not talking just about the Kelvin temperature, which is on that spectrum of the Kelvin situation. This departs from the world of Kelvin. All those, these things are, are calibrated to hit Kelvin temperatures. But uh, a lot of these, this particular light that we're looking at here is app controlled, as you can see here in the video. And it's pretty amazing. I've got a lot of camera stuff that has apps. This stuff is the reviews. You're not only shopping for a light system at this point, you're shopping for a control system. And who wants to be monkeying around hooking your lights up to a Wi-Fi or whatever? It's a pain in the neck. Watch this. They're using the, the app in this camera. They're taking a photograph of a physical object and then he can make that light the exact same color. You could do, it. having this means that you could have evening lighting at 3,000 or 2,800 degrees Kelvin in the dim of the evening and the warmth of the fire. And then in the middle of the day with all the kids running in and out in their bathing suits and it's that time of year, you could be at 5,000 Kelvin like the light outside. That's specifically why, one of the reasons that I chose 5,000 Kelvin here in the office uh, is because, turns, turns back, we're, we're done with the slides now. Um, if you look at our area, get the widest shot you can. But what, uh, like, in it camera four or something? Yeah, uh, go, to, go to camera three. I, I set this one up specially for this. Because you can't, I don't know if uh, this camera position, I didn't set it up special enough, but this is actually our paint stain area where if you, if you make your color selections by visiting our office, uh, those are our exterior stain colors for log homes back there, and we represent at least three different major stain companies that are, have dedicated product lines for the log home industry. And so those are, those are exterior stains, which by definition mean they, if you want to pick a color, you should pick that color. Go back to the other one. Oh yeah, you can see, oh, you can see them better in the other one. I see that. Okay, you can see part of our stain uh, wall back there showing the products. Uh, but when you're gonna make a color choice, you wanna make, it, make that choice under the lighting conditions where it'll be on your home. So it only makes sense for this area back here showing exterior stains to be illuminated in 5,000 and specifically 5,500 degree Kelvin in the case of that display area back there because I wanted you to be able to make good choices. Now, that's, that, making a choice even with accurate light is always a second preference. The, the ideal way of checking your stain color would be to get a sample of the material, the specific material that you selected for your house and uh, our, our uh, Stain, we have samples from like Permachink, and you can pick a bunch of colors uh, and to paint a sample and judge from that at your 
location. That is the very best way. That's the way, if you've got a professional painter, that's the way they would prefer to work. And also, you don't have to travel. It's simpler. We'll, we send those, we'll st send those stain colors. But anyway, you get the point. Uh, those, uh, when I say on those RGB lighting, if you're that customer who can think about that kind of thing today, um, don't just shop for the lighting system, shop for the app system. Now, that, I don't know what the capabilities are of residential RGB lighting. Those little, uh, the, the, frankly, the instruments made for motion picture production are always going to be built to a higher standard. And even though that little light that I've shown you is kind of a consumer product, it's a prosumer, it's, that's not one of your mainstream motion picture lighting companies. And, and certainly a little light the size of a deck of cards is, is um, you know, that's, that's not what's really used. That's, that's done for, to put a little background here. I might, I might use something like that to put a little up light on the bottom of those stairs there, something like that, just hide it in scene or something like that. That's not a, that's not a, a key light or a main lighting instrument by any means. But the application, uh, nobody wants to mess around with Wi-Fi to get that kind of stuff. And that product, the, the app that runs on your iPhone or your Android device on that has been reviewed spectacularly because it doesn't even, you don't have to do any of that stuff. When you buy a light, you enter the serial number of that light into your phone one time only. And it is instant on wherever you go. And not only that, but uh, the little lights and all the other new lighting instruments from that particular manufacturer, they form a mesh network. Uh, so that in a studio such as we're in here where we've got, you know, five or six lights around the room, um, it's just instant. It's, it's bulletproof. There's no monkeying around with it. Nobody likes to have, oh, we've got to turn on this live stream at 1130. Nobody likes to be over there monkeying around with a Wi-Fi connection, you know, and getting a phone to work or getting an app to talk to something. So, so the same thing. If you, if you, could, you could get something that was uh, the best, coolest lighting system in the world, but if the control system isn't easy and bulletproof, well then, you know, what fun is that to do if you want to do your house up for Halloween, if you have to work three days on an app to make that happen? If, you, if, you've, if, if it's good, it ought to be easy. All right, hey, too much. How long have you been doing this? What time is it, Sandy? It's 20 minutes after one. Hey, I, I brought this in under and faster than the guy who did the hour and a half session. And uh, his was about, his was about uh, website development. I'd say that's a coin toss whether his was more boring than mine. But anyway, too much. Maybe we're going to break these up in episodes. But, you know, it, when the time comes and you're building that house or you get, you know, the day that we put something out might, might be the day you're ready for this. But hopefully this was some useful information in getting you orient, oriented. The thing that I'd, the key points I'd hope to help you make is to understand the palette of color that's available to you in, de in decorating your home with light. Those two magic, the word Kelvin and understanding Kelvin as the, the, on the spectrum of natural colored light, not theatrical or disco lights or lighting effects, but natural light, that that Kelvin and that 3,000 degrees Kelvin is a warm light that is prevalent in residential, but that, but now that it's available and it never has been available before, 5,000 degree true white, it definitely has applications in homes and it may be in certain conditions better. It's your choice. It's your choice. Don't mix sources. Don't do things haphazardly. Keep those spaces looking beautiful. Um, you, you'll run into situations where if you've picked a lighting, you'd never do this with a painter. Uh, pick your colors and, uh, oh, one more thing and, and say, oh, I've got, a, I've got a, another can of paint left over from another job on the truck. Let's use it. You wouldn't do that, you know. Uh, it might be easy, or he might not have been 
he might have gone to the paint store or the electrician goes to the paint and he doesn't, under, you know, it's never mattered before. Nobody ever cared about this. Nobody ever bothered with this before. Well, they didn't have the option of bothering with it. So anyway, the electricians, yeah, they need to, this is, um, they're, you know, it, it has implications for their craft, but it's not a hard thing. And, and it won't take them long to, to appreciate. And it is beautiful. It is beautiful. It is getting the lighting right in your home. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, like those pictures earlier in the show, the turning on the light. It is, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's that vitality, that life, uh, that the, when I'm photographing that house and all those lights are on, it's like this is an, ex an extension of life. It's not just an inanimate object at that point. So I know that might be sound a little nutty, but you just watch wherever you go. And um, the guy at Elliott Electric, the regional manager I was talking to, when I brought up RGB lighting, he says, he says, he says that is the rule in commercial spaces, which is the proper domain of architects, where they are they pay attention to that kind of stuff. You better know that when a commercial building or a commercial space or um, that th just just watch, take note where you go, and I, I, not the Mexican restaurant comic book lighting and you know the. The, I mean, that kind of decorative stuff is cool, but I'm talking about the tasteful things. This is like, you know, log homes are not chrome and glass and all these uh, synthetic materials or synthetic colors. So I'm just like, this is, this is fundam fundamental, back to basic, simple, simple of that true white light spectrum, that 3,000 degree Kelvin, 5,000 degree Kelvin. And watch what you do as you move Watch as you move around the world. Um, one of the, uh, uh, get my age, I go to too many funerals in Welch Funeral Home, which is over a hundred year old company here in Longview, Texas. They built a new, um, a new facility about 10 years ago and they paid attention to this kind of thing. And, and you know, you sit in a, in a uh, we, you know, we all go early to, take a seat and be reverent and mind their own business a little bit during, before a funeral. And uh, I'm sitting there looking at their lighting. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, they just didn't stick what fit. They, they put what was right. And it, it's um, lighting done well can it's a sa it's it, it's that sacred place uh, just like life treat your home like that um, hey it's time to hit the fade to black switch but hey before we go if anybody ever watches this we love you on YouTube and all it is that like and subscribe and all that kind of stuff, but the ring the bell, that's when you know, and we'll get some people back on doing this that uh, are not, won't torture you like I do. So now we'll hit the fade to black. <laughs>